a different take on yield farming. More gamified, fun experience. Should we open some crates? There's no advantage for bot farm to turn up. But Infinex is going to be like the Swiss army knife of on-chain activity. Welcome to an episode of Seb Talks. I'm here with Kane, who's an OG DeFi legend, the man behind Synthetics, which we'll quickly touch on, and also the founder of Infinex. Hello, Kane. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Seb. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm good. Good. Early morning in Sydney here, so make sure I'm uh, my brain's firing. I've had coffee, so let's see how we go. Nice. Well, for those that don't know you, which... Um, because I'm more Solana based and you're new to the Solana ecosystem, might be a couple of people. Did you want to give us a little bit of a, a rundown on who you are? Yeah, so uh, I got into DeFi uh, via, you know, I guess the 2017 ICO era. Um, started a, a stablecoin project called Haven, which eventually pivoted into Synthetics. Um, we became one of, I guess, the, the first kind of cohort of uh, of DeFi projects that, uh, you know, gained adoption on Ethereum. Um, and then, you know, we were one of the first projects that, that kind of, uh, led into DeFi summer, I guess, with some of those incentives and, you know, different, different structures like yield farming. Um, and we had, uh, we had a number of different things that I guess kind of helped to catalyze that, um, you know, leading into compound, uh, launching their token and, and really kicking off DeFi summer. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been building in DeFi for a long time and, uh, I guess you know, last year I, I sort of realized that, uh, there was something missing and, and that's what led me to build Infinex. I love it. I really do love it. I've done a lot of research. I'm just sharing the screen quickly, just so people can see who you are on Twitter so they can follow you. Yeah. And this is the Twitter for Infinex. And for those that don't know synthetics, it was such a it had a ma it had a major run up in the last DeFi cycle, and you mentioned in other podcasts how this was all before there were even bridges, and you just had a new way to do things, which um, I think was absolutely amazing. But I see the value in Infinex, which we'll discuss because of the fact that it's so much more simple, right? Like this. I found this to be quite complicated and I was full time at this stage, but it was complicated. Uh, maybe it was complicated for me. I'm, I'm not necessarily like, obviously some people really got it, but, uh, I think, I think, you know, when it comes to DeFi, right? Like there's, there are things that people want to do and then there's how they're done. And in those early periods, we sort of conflated the two a little bit, right? Like we, we, you know, talked so much about how we were doing it because we were so impressed with ourselves, right? That we we're, you know, doing these amazing things on chain uh, and, and oftentimes forgot to actually explain, you know, what you could do, you know, the job that the person wanted to do, right? Um, and so I think when you compare a lot of early DeFi with say centralized uh, competitors, right? You know, um, in our case uh, with Synthetics, it was, it was perps. And, you know, BitMEX was the dominant perps DEX, you know, for a really long time before FTX uh, turned up, you know, BitMEX, they would talk about the perpetual, they invented it, you know, why it was good, but it wasn't like their primary reason to exist, right? Like their reason to exist was for traders to trade. They talked about trading interfaces. They talked about, you know, um, the things that traders cared about. And so I do think that that is one of the things that we sort of got wrong last cycle, right? It, you know, uh, financial engineering is very niche audience. Um, you know, so the, the thing I guess that I'm hoping to do with Infinex is take a lot of the amazing stuff that was built in, you know, the last five years in DeFi and, you know, other on-chain protocols and make it more accessible without necessarily talking about the financial plumbing of it, but just talk about what you can do with it. You know, you can you can now click a button and, and do this amazing thing. Um, and, you know, it's non-custodial. There aren't the same trade-offs as using a centralized service. Um, you know, all of the things that we think are beneficial about crypto. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it's about the utility that the user gets. Mm. I, I, I agree. And um, look, perhaps has never been my skill set, but I think I'm going to find a lot of things that I love about Infinex. So uh, I'll put my screen back on again. 
because I've already done a tutorial on this. This will be linked below, but we're going to do a little bit of a run through here. This is my tutorial account. And I think who better than to tell me what I should be doing and to explain it than the founder. Should we open some crates or did you want to, did you want to mention what is the crate at the moment or the crate run? Yeah. So crate run is a, a different take, I guess, on, uh, on yield farming. So, you know, we have this trade-off right in, in the space, um, that just is a fundamental trade-off between, uh, a linear distribution, which, uh, I think most people would say favors whales, right? Um, you, you know, in principle, it's, it's debatable whether it favors whales or whether it just favors, uh, the TVL that you deposit, right. You know, in a linear fashion, but I think most people who are depositing not much would say, well, you know, the whales are getting the majority of the yield or the majority of the benefit of the platform. Right. Um, now the problem with that is it means that all of the kind of, uh, you know, smaller users who, who are excited about the platform feel like they're not, you know, getting uh, a fair, uh, a fair shake. Right. Um, and, and that disincentivizes engagement. It disincentivizes, you know, people to talk about the platform and, and, you know, be really excited about it, learn about it. Right. Um, which is not what we want. So the trade-off though, uh, and I think this is the mistake that most projects are making at the moment is to make the distribution non-linear, right? Which then favors in theory, the small player. Right. In theory, the, the small enthusiast, right, who might only have a few hundred dollars to deposit. The problem is that while those, you know, small farmers are out there with, you know, a little spade digging in the dirt, right, uh, this swarm of locusts just comes and eats everything around them, which is the industrial civil farmer, right? Um, you know, these people with huge bot farms that just come and, and devour everything, right? And, and kill everyone and, and, you know, leave nothing left, right? Um, and so if, you, if you're if you kind of tempted to make these things non-linear, you create this environment where effect, effectively no one gets anything, right? The locusts get everything and that doesn't help anyone, right? It doesn't help the whales, it doesn't help, you know, small farmers, it doesn't help uh, any genuine uh, user of the protocol. Um, and so we had this idea that, okay, what if we were to just add some randomness, right? Which means that, you know, a small farmer, uh, is, is, you know, maybe not going to get much most of the time, but occasionally they will actually get something and it disincentivizes civils. And so there's actually more for everyone. Right. Um, and so that's the idea. The idea is that, uh, you know, you create this game where, um, you open crates, um, inside the crates, there are sometimes prizes. Uh, there are sometimes, uh, you know, things like boosts that are just uh, effectively acceleration, uh, you know, mechanisms in the game. Um, and it just turns it into this more gamified, fun experience. Um, but it's not really sibilable. You know, there's no advantage for uh, a bot farm to turn up. And this is one of the reasons that I think, you know, you, you sort of mentioned that you're surprised it hasn't blown up. A lot of the the um, a lot of those bot farms are also engagement farming, right? If you think about it from a tactical perspective, if you're running a bot farm, you have the skill set to actually mass flood engagement, right? And pretend like this is you know some some wave of excitement that's coming from all of these accounts on crypto Twitter or whatever. Um, and you know they're they're not just farming the incentives, they're actually farming engagement and, and making it look like it's a bigger thing than it is, uh, which, you know, again, all of that sort of destroys the organic activity. So I would rather have, uh, right now, as it stands, I would rather have a small group of very enthusiastic real people than tens of thousands of bots, right? So, uh, so basically, the, what you're looking at here uh, is you've got your actual deposit, um, you've got your boosts, uh, that have been applied, um, which you've got, you know, quite a few boosts here. So that's, that's pretty impressive. I don't know how many crates you've opened, but you've, uh, you've gotten pretty lucky when it comes to boosts, it looks like. Well, this is mostly referrals. This is, ah, this your is, referrals. Okay. Yeah, right. This is not, right. this is not many boosts because, um, it was on my radar. It fell off my radar. And then I just got in just recently again. Yeah. So, nice. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so basically, you're going to open a crate, right? Um, and the crate opening mechanism uh, uses pith entropy. 
Um, so we go, uh, we have 5 million crates, each with a unique identifier. Um, and we go basically and call Pith and say, which crate of these four, you know, you're opening four crates now, uh, go and open four crates and, and tell us what's in those crates. Um, and, you know, this is all happening on chain. Uh, it's provably fair. You can verify, you know, all of the, the transactions on chain to, to ensure that, you know, uh, this is a, a fair process. All right. So you got a thousand dollar boost, right? So, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is it's not a real prize, but it's a prize that lets you get more prizes, right? It's, it lets you, you know, kind of accelerate your, uh, your opening. Um, so in, in all seriousness, that was a pretty unlucky draw, right? Um, you should get something, uh, every second crate. Um, but you know, you can, you can stake that extra, uh, money and you're going to farm some crates a bit faster next time. So, um, you know, when you look at the, the total TVL here, which is kind of, I, I guess the, the critical number, right? Um, there's 148 mil of TVL, uh, and on top of that, unfortunately, because you were a latecomer, um, on top of that TVL, there's another about a billion dollars worth of boosts that have been earned because uh, we're getting close to the end of the campaign. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, right now uh, it's it's a bit challenging to get in. But <clears throat> what we've done is there's a campaign that's going for the next three days where if you have uh, any of the DeFi assets that have just been added, there's 17 assets that have been added, including a bunch of Solana assets, you can deposit those. Um, and you'll get a 5x boost on the deposit, uh, which happens, I think, in about 48 hours. Um, so the last few days of Crate Run, there's, there's still a bit of time to deposit and, uh, and you know, earn some crates. And I, exactly. I guess it's probably, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you jump in. Oh, no, no, just, um, yeah, so someone can go in from Solana with Jupe, Ray, JTR, or W, and they go and they deposit it, uh, cool. they stake it, and then they're not going to see the boost until the end uh, per someone on your team or moderators. The boost isn't live. Um, it's, it's explained here or, or somewhere around this area. Uh, but along the lines of in a, in, at the end of like the three-day period, then the boost is applied. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So there'll be, there'll be a one-time boost that will run to the end of Crate Run, which I think gives you about five days, the last five days. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is there's still quite a few, uh, of the, of the large prizes that are available to have, there's a, there's a list, um, on the website, you can go and just check to see what's still, uh, what still hasn't been won. Yeah, there is. I think there's still 450 million bonk. There um, you go. So this whole thing, the crate runners, as, as we know, but just for the audience, this is your, your method to attract the people that you want to attract and to reward those uh, early users. But Infinex is going to be like, like the Swiss army knife, essentially, of, of on-chain activity is, is how I kind of think of it. Well, how would you describe it? Like the actual... So I, the, the simplest way to describe it, right, is for the last decade or more, um, we have been sort of forced into this uh, unfortunate situation of most crypto activity happens in someone's database, right? Um, and when you, when you, you know, for good reason, right? When you look at Binance and you really think about it, Binance is the best cross-chain, chain-abstracted infrastructure ever invented in crypto, right? The problem is it has a very harsh trade-off of it's completely centralized. You're completely giving up custody of your assets, right? Now, for most people, that is actually fine, right? And, and for a lot of people, giving up custody of their assets is actually helpful because they don't want to self-custody. Self-custody is scary, right? Um, and so, you know, the trade-off that you have with Binance is you give up custody, but you get this amazing cross-chain infrastructure. You can have USDC that you've deposited from Solana, and you can then go and buy Litecoin, right? on the Litecoin network. Like, I don't know if anyone knows how to get to the Litecoin network except for centralized exchanges, right? Like, does anyone actually know how to do a transaction on, on Litecoin, right? Um, so, no so you know, like, I don't, I've, so I've never done a transaction. I've, I've owned Litecoin, but I owned it through Kraken, right? I, I didn't uh, buy it, you know, directly uh, on chain um, on the Litecoin network. So, you know, this is, this is a huge advantage for centralized exchanges. They have 
this infrastructure that abstracts away all of the, the crypto aspects and makes it very easy, right? Um, and so it's no wonder that for the last decade, we've been mainly using centralized exchanges to do crypto stuff. But as we all know, right, um, you know, as Ethereum has, uh, has gotten better and scaled and as Solana has gotten better and scaled, um, there's more cool stuff on chain, right? There's, there's better stuff happening on chain uh, than what is happening in Binance. The question is, how do we bring that cool stuff to people? How do we bring pumped up fun and radium and, you know, all of this amazing tech that's been built, right? And, you know, uh, and Gito Sol and like, we need to make that accessible to the average user, right? And so this is the, the kind of uh, uh, purpose of Infinex. The purpose of Infinex is to rebuild uh, the, the interface for users um, so that they can easily access all of this amazing technology, right? To rebuild exchanges, rebuild these centralized exchanges that are running on web two infrastructure, centralized infrastructure using on-chain infrastructure. So when you do a transaction, it's happening on chain. When you deposit funds, they're in your custody. It's a non-custodial service, um, but it's just as easy to use. And this is not, a, this is not a trivial exercise. It turns out, right? Like this is actually quite hard, but it, for an end user, you shouldn't have to care. You shouldn't have to care that this is super technically impressive. You just want to click a button and have the thing happen, right? And so, you know, to go back to the Litecoin example, uh, if you've got USDC on Solana and for some bizarre reason, you really feel the need to buy Litecoin, we need to make that available to you. If we don't, then a Binance user who is used to having these set, set of features is not going to migrate. Right. And that is the, the end goal. We need to migrate all of the users that are on centralized exchanges. We need to bring them on chain and we need to make all of the features that they know and love accessible to them in the same easy single button click. Mm. And your branding is on point is the UX layer, the user experience layer. So we can basically expect, I mean, I don't know when you're welcome to say if it's, if you're allowed, if you're, if you want to, but. We'll be able we'll be able to go to Infinex and we'll be able to do our swaps and like I I could imagine there would be like a way to do an NFT mint potentially in the future or to get into Ave and borrow something but we're doing it in such a way that the UI is not confusing and we can't go and sign transactions that are going to end up giving permission of all of our NFTs to some scammer on blur or open sea is that kind of that's that's right i mean you know you notice you open crates right uh when you click that crate opening uh thing and again you know not to get too stuck in the technical weeds but there are, are like 10 different transactions that are happening in the background there right um if this were a normal wallet style interface right uh you'd be clicking transactions you know for the next five minutes right trying to, mm. to make that happen instead you click a single button and in the back end it goes and does all the things you need to do it knows the transaction that you want you're clicking the button you're showing your intent to open a crate and it says cool i've got you and it goes in the background and does all the things you need to do and then comes back and says here's the result right in, in a very simple interface i mean this is not you know, rocket science at all, right? Like if you go to a centralized exchange and you click a trade button, it does the trade. There's all kinds of weird stuff that's happening in the database and the back end and the front end, you know, but it doesn't pop that up, you know, to, and show you all of the cool stuff that it's doing in the database, right? It just gives you a result. And that's where we need to get to. No, you're, you're spot on. You're, this is the thing that we definitely need. Um, did you have uh, any... Like after this, we're we'll, we're gonna talk about the NFT. But when when do you think we'd see some sort of integrations? I mean, this is already fun. This is a bit of like gambling or chance and fun. But um, in terms of the, like I imagine it's gonna take quite a bit of time to ship integrations. You're gonna have one integration, then the next. I know that Jupiter has been worked on for the people in Solana. But is there like some sort of roadmap or something you can tell us? And if there isn't, that's okay as well. Yeah, th there is. Uh, so we're, we're kind of broken things up into seasons, right? So we had our, our pre-launch season. This is uh, this season that we're in the midst of is all about the platform, 
showing off the platform, like getting people used to, you know, already you and I, right? We forgot that when you click the button that there's on-chain stuff happening, right? It's, it's going to happen very quickly, in my opinion, right? People are going to like just get used to clicking buttons and not worry about signing transactions and just go. And the reason why is because 90% of your life when you're interacting with Web2 stuff, you just click a button and something happens, right? So I think we're going to forget about all of this crazy signing nonsense pretty quickly. Um, and so part of what this uh, launch process is about is uh, getting people used to the platform, right? Right now, the platform is the product, the onboarding flow, getting people used to pass keys. Pass keys are fairly novel, um, but the interesting thing about pass keys is it's uh, a situation right now where Web 2 and Web 3 are converging. You know, you have these trillion dollar companies, right, that are pushing the adoption of pass keys, uh, whether it's Amazon or Apple or, um, you know, Microsoft, they're all pushing pass key adoption. And we're able to kind of ride that wave in Web3. And everyone's going to be used to pass keys in the next, you know, probably year or two. Uh, and we'll see that like legacy password tech will be basically deprecated, right? Um, so this is the leaned... first time I use one. Did you have like yeah. a really simple explanation for a pass key? And I know what you mean. It's kind of like during COVID, everyone had to learn how to use a QR scanner. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And now we have yeah. to learn how to use pass keys. So, so pass keys, in my opinion, the, the simple explanation, especially for a crypto user, is it's just a token. It, it's a crypto token, right? It, this is crypto tech flowing back into Web2, right? They've looked at some of the stuff we're doing and like, okay, most of it's crazy, but there's a couple of cool things here. Um, and one of them is that you have this crypto token that is stored in a secure enclave on your device that is identifying you as the owner of the account, right? Um, and, you know, think of it as an NFT or, or whatever, but it's an NFT that, uh, that basically says, this is Seb, right? And if you present that token, uh, you, you know, you've got a device that has that token on it, um, and you can share the token across devices if you want. You can have it on your, uh, on your laptop and on your phone, right? Um, then the, the service says, ah, okay, this, this is that person, right? Now, the interesting thing is, this is not like some trusted third party service, right? That's, that's doing it. This is literally the, the interface is talking directly to the token. Right. And, and saying, ah, yes, I do know that person. Right. Um, and so, uh, for, for a crypto user, that should be pretty straightforward, right? You have your tokens and, you know, you have an NFT. It's like, that's my PFP. This is the same thing. You show up with a PFP and the system goes, oh, yeah, I, I know that. Uh, I know that PFP. I know Seb. Cool. In you go and you get access to your account. Um, it, it's a very, simple and straightforward way of, uh, of you know, uh, unlocking accounts. There's a lot of infrastructure that's required. And this is where, again, we're able to kind of ride the wave of these trillion dollar companies have invested, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into building secure enclaves. It's built into the hardware of devices. It's built into the operating system, um, you know, and, and we're able to just take advantage of that. Because mm. you mentioned in the Lightspeed podcast how uh, the host was like, yeah, I kind of treat it like a hot wallet. And you're like, mm. it's, it's kind of like a, it's not a, it's not a cold wallet, of course, but it's almost like a step above a hot wallet because you mentioned how you can kind of with, you can remove access and, and uh, like to a certain private key and all that sort of stuff, which is kind of complex. Maybe it's a little bit too complex for this podcast, but just in general, you legitimately think this, like this is the future. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The ability to unlock a private key with a pass key uh, is a, a huge usability unlock, right? It, it really removes a lot of complexity for users. Um, and again, for your users, right, probably less, uh, you know, the, the people watching this podcast, right, probably less impressive, right? Most of, most of the people watching this podcast have already set up a seed phrase, you know, they understand private keys, they've done, they've been onboarded into Phantom or um, Soulflare or whatever. Um, so, you know, this is not necessarily for them, although it will make their lives easier, for sure, right? Um, but they've already gone through the education pain of like how to do all this stuff, right? Who it's for is like their brother or their uncle or their Uber driver, right? Who in six months time is gonna be like, how do I buy Sol? I want to buy this Solana thing. Like, what do I do? Right. Um, and the answer needs to be not, well, go and get your browser and install Soulflare. And then, you know, there's going to be these weird words and don't let show anyone the, like it needs to be, oh yeah, there's actually a really good service called Infinex. Just sign up for it. You set up a passkey and they're like, oh yeah, I know passkey is my, you know, 
Apple account uses that or whatever. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you just get a pass key and, you know, set up an account and then you, you, you know, can, uh, buy crypto directly there. You can buy Solana directly in that platform. Uh, which is what most of us do now with Binance, right? If someone new says, hey, you know, I want to buy some crypto, we go, uh, sign up to Coinbase or sign up to Binance or whatever, because there isn't an alternative for a new person. You're not going to send them out into the wilderness and, and say, yeah, you know, go start installing, uh, you know, weird, uh, weird browser extensions uh, as a starting point. Right. And then Infinex will have access to I guess, uh, on-ramping and off-ramping services in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the big, uh, that's one of the big things again for your, for the, the, you know, people watching this podcast, you already have crypto, right? There's probably no one watching this podcast who doesn't already have crypto. So, uh, you know, the ability to, to move funds between exchanges or between platforms is, is probably fairly comfortable for the average user, uh, you know, of, uh, of this podcast. Right. Um, but for new people, they don't have any crypto, right? So you need to have fiat, you know, gateways, right? Fiat on ramps and off ramps. Um, so in the, in the immediate term, we probably won't have fiat on ramps uh, um, straight away, right? Um, but, you know, by next year, as new users start showing up, uh, we need to have all of that uh, infrastructure, the same as you do for a centralized exchange. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, should we have a... Should we have a look at the NFT side? Because this is the stuff yeah. that I've done a bit of research into. You've got an exceptionally novel way of uh, getting people to participate in governance. And I could do with some, some questions. It relates to the patron pass and the patron NFT. But first, I thought it might be relevant that uh, this will be linked below, but this is a very good thread. I went and fanboyed, liked everything. <laughs> um, and you've already touched on it a little bit in terms of the reason for breaking the meta, the meta being, you know, civil farmers come in, they absolutely destroy, um, they destroy the major, they take the majority of the rewards, you know, they get more and more creative, they whatnot. And then the other, the reverse is a whale comes in, they deposit capital, they make their 20%, they exit, they don't tell anybody about the app, they don't onboard anyone. So you're trying to get people that are sticky, I guess. And you, and you, yeah. Well, I mean, do you remember this? Do you remember this tweet thread? It's, it's sizable. I, I do. I do. I, I think the, the TLDR, right, um, is uh, that we have a, a sort of set of incentives right now that are broken, right? It's no one's fault. The, these incentives emerged, right, um, you know, out of, uh, out of different things that have happened over the last five or six years, right? But the end result of this set of incentives is that the only way to distribute tokens to people is to give them away for free, right? The only way that, that most people are comfortable giving away tokens and distributing token, token ownership and, and uh, ownership of a platform uh, is to give them away for free. Now, the right. problem with that is if you're giving something away for free that has value in an adversarial environment, it's not going to take long before the adversaries are, are you know, destroying you, right? And that's what we're seeing. Um, and, you know, we, we, like, we're very creative in crypto. So, you know, some very smart people came up with this idea of, okay, points, points will allow us to do this. Right. And, you know, that definitely worked for a little while. Uh, the points meta, you know, the adversaries were kind of looking at the points going, Hmm, I don't know, is this a trick or whatever? Right. And so real users were able to get access to points and, and, you know, uh, meaningful, uh, you know, ownership of, of protocols, um, and, and governance participation. Uh, but then once the adversaries worked out points, it was game over, right? And, you know, you saw all the frustration of like, hang on, but like I've been farming points for the last nine months and I didn't get anything. How's that possible? And it's like, well, see that, you know, cloud of locusts over there, they've got all your points, right? They took them all. Um, and so, you know, the, the, uh, the solution in my mind is that you need to create a different set of incentives. Right. We have, we have, we've seen different sets of incentives, right? One of the sets of incentives is people have to have skin in the game. If you're farming tokens for free, uh, you're going to attract only mercenary people, right? Only the adversaries will show up really, right? Um, and they'll maximize the game and, and extract all the value from the protocol. Um, but there are people who are excited about things, right? Whether it's LRTs, LSTs, whether it's, you know, 
uh, Jupiter or Eigenlayer, or, you know, whatever the thing, they're excited about a thing. They see it. They're like, okay, I see this is a powerful new tool, you know, and, and this is going to be amazing. Um, I want to participate. I want to participate in this. I want to help govern it. I want to, you know, be an active uh, member of this community. Um, and the very simple way to do that is say, okay, you can buy access. Like governance is valuable. It's a valuable resource. Being able to control the governance of a project is an important thing. If you care about it, then you can buy it. And like that is fairly straightforward, right? Like it's not a, it's not rocket science, right? Like, um, you know, let people pay for things. Uh, and that shifts the whole dynamic with the adversaries because the adversaries are, who are trying to extract value from these projects and extract value from the ecosystem don't want to pay. They don't want to take any risk. They're looking for a zero risk play, right? Where they can extract maximal value. As soon as you add risk to them, they're out, right? Which means now the dynamic completely shifts and, and genuine users get to participate again and, and get to, uh, you know, be involved in governance and, and you know, have exposure to projects. I love it. Um, it makes sense. There's a, there's a, there's a recent airdrop on Solana, Sanctum, which had like, they, they tried some things and like a lot of, it I agree with, but yeah, it was, Oh, the FUD campaign, uh, all sorts. It was just crazy. And yeah, I saw, I saw it's tough. It's, it's tough to distribute tokens for free. Like that's, that's the, you know, today in 2024, it's hard to distribute free tokens and have people be happy. Exactly. And you've also decided to go with NFTs as opposed to tokens to try and minimum, well, try and minimize the fact that just SEC and other government bodies are just, I guess, backward and don't give any clear rules. Is that, is that? I think the, the, the purpose of the NFT is, is uh, to as much as possible highlight the fact that this is, you know, a governance token, right? Which is a bit weird, right? Because most governance, you know, like governance tokens historically have been ERC 20s, right? And, and then they became SPL tokens as, as Solana, um, you know, took off. Um, the problem with using a fungible token uh, as, as the governance token uh, is finding the, the, the distinction between, you know, what is speculative, the speculative use case around, you know, the project and what is genuine participation in, in governance becomes quite hard. Um, uh, I also think that like the distribution mechanisms that we have for ERC twenties and SPL tokens are uh, a bit different. You know, LVPs and and LFGs and things like that. Uh, it it does uh, have a different dynamic. Whereas like an NFT mint, um, I think you know we've sort of forgot this meta. But in twenty twenty one, we got pretty good at distributing these. NFT sets, right? Um, you know, and, and the distribution would typically be much wider, less concentrated. Um, you know, it wouldn't be just captured by a single, you know, party or whatever. Um, and so, you know, when I looked at all the different mechanisms that have been invented since 2017, you know, when, when I last had this problem, right? I actually kind of landed on the NFT meta as something that I, I thought was more fair and, and more open and more transparent. Um, and it has the second order effect of it's a non-fungible token. Uh, they're not as liquid. It's, you know, they're not going to be listed on exchanges, all of that sort of stuff, right? So, you know, it really makes it clear that this is a, a, a tool for governance rather than, you know, uh, necessarily a, a speculative tool, right? Um, you know, or makes it as clear as you possibly can, I guess, right, in, in the current structure. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that that will... Uh, that will you know come across for uh, people who are excited about the project and that they will you know want to participate in governance. Um, I think governing, a, particularly for a project like this, um, even more so, being credible. And you know we can we look at like the the Ethereum Solana tension, right? And and this is this is really critical, right? Um, we delayed the launch of Infinex to ensure that Solana was available at launch, right? Um, and, and the reason that governance did that, right? Governance decided to wait, right? Um, you know, the council at the time was like, no, we're, we're not going to launch this thing until Solana is ready. And the reason why the council did that is because they had a vested interest in, in being incredibly neutral. You know, if you look like it's Ethereum and then Solana and then all of the L2s, right? So, you know, Solana is a meaningful 
percentage of the TVL, right? This is not an afterthought. Um, and that, that, whole, uh, that whole approach, I guess, uh, comes down to being incredibly neutral, right? If the Solana community thinks that they're being treated as a second class citizen and, and not you know, being properly considered, uh, then it's going to be impossible to get adoption. From, from that community. And this goes for new chains as well, right? You know, when we launch uh, new chains in the future, uh, probably not Litecoin, unfortunately, but you know, maybe some other ones, right? Um, and, and that credible neutrality is so critical, more so than, than a normal protocol, like just a normal DeFi protocol where you're like doing parameterization, like governance in, in Infinex uh, is, is about ensuring that everyone, every community, has fair access and, and you know, feels like they're being taken care of. Uh, and so it's so important that we get wide distribution of the governance tokens into the Solana community, into you know, the, the Cosmos community, into the Polkadot community even, right? Um, and, and that's why we've, we've sort of taken our time, I think, to uh, build awareness and, and not you know, go too quickly. Right. Um, I mean, the, it, is, it is completely changing the meta. Because of your like for I believe this could work not because there's there's no blueprint on it, just because you do have that kind of OG status, you know your stuff, uh, you've got a competent team, and yeah, I mean look, we have to see how how, how it goes. Because you're right. It's a grand it, experiment. <laughs> it is. And look, the other the other system isn't working. As you said, you know, like your your hedge funds and whatnot, they, you know, the seed, seed raises, the seed rounds, they get tokens at early points. They're vested and locked and whatnot, but they're normally at multiples. This is like, it doesn't matter who, who wants one of these. They basically all have to pay the same unless they win one or from a previous campaign. Correct me if I've got anything wrong. No, from the speed run right. campaign, they can take 200,000 governance points and they can convert it into a, a patron NFT. Which right? you know that was about that was about three percent of the supply, right? Uh, right. You know, so I, I still think that, you know just to be clear, I think that there is value for airdrops, right? For people who are participating in a project, helping to test things early on, right? It just shouldn't be 20, 30 percent of the supply, right? That's that's never going to work. Um, so mm. a small percentage of the supply given to you know early adopters who tested stuff out, I think that makes total sense, right? And you know, I'm pretty confident that the people who got that GP are not industrial farmers. I don't think they were, we were on their radar at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually entered, but I didn't stake. I, I just missed it. I, oh, I no. deposited. So, <laughs> silly me. Oh, man. Um, yeah. But hey, look, I'm going to blame my myself and my research team. There's too many things to cover. This um, is the thing. Attention is very hard. Uh, it's a very scarce resource in crypto. Uh, today, right, and and this is you know this is one of the other reasons why it's important to have a wide group of people participating to be advocates yeah. for for a new project. I have to be far more selective in what I cover as well, just because some things will not be as good as others. Um, now, so we've got this fifty fifty percent going to the community mint, and then the other fifty percent into like treasury and core working group. You mentioned on the other podcast that I will link below the Lightspeed one. That you want twenty to thirty percent of all your tokens out there, like at token generation event, uh, for like price discovery and just decentralization or whatever. But you, you you may have had more information on that or a viewpoint there. I mean, I, I think that that's like a, a fairly well understood uh, threshold, right? Um, you know, if, if uh, the the challenge is right that. Um, you know, there, no matter what you do, there will be some speculation, right? Um, and so what you don't want is for that speculation to distort the market, right? And not, and not have, you know, proper price discovery. Um, and so if you only have a tiny fraction of the supply circulating, uh, it's impossible to get proper uh, price discovery. So, you know, you, you, need, you need enough liquidity for, uh, you know, people to be able to get in and out. Because there will inevitably be some speculation. You know, crypto, crypto is a very speculative industry. Um, you, you're never going to get rid of all speculation, I don't think. Um, you know, I don't think there's a mechanism that could could necessarily do that. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to have some speculation, you want you want price discovery to be as efficient as possible, which means that you need liquidity. If you don't have liquidity, it's it's going to be distorted. 
Right. Now, we'll go over the pricing in a second, but um, just just confirming. So this was created by, this proposal was, and like the pricing and whatnot, uh, was created by the working group or by the DAO, or was it created by the team? Uh, it was each proposal is written. I actually don't know who wrote this proposal, uh, to be totally honest with you. Uh, who's the author, uh, on the Igor proposal? and Kamen. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was the, the treasury seat. So those are two council members, uh, who wrote okay. this proposal. Um, there've been many discussions, uh, in the community and the working group and, you know, a various different constituents of the project. Um, and I think that, uh, the two people who are the authors of this, uh, are a current council members serving on the council. Right. So in order to get an NFT, if we go back to this, we could win one, right? Or, uh, the patron pass. Um, this uh, it guarantees an opportunity to purchase a patron NFT because not everyone can. Or we've got down here, we've got the patron ticket, which gives us the opportunity to win a patron pass. Is that how that flow goes? Uh, yes, effectively. Yeah, the, the ticket, uh, there are 200,000 tickets um, and, you know, there'll be circa 15, 20,000 patron NFTs that will uh, be available by the time we get through all the patron passes and, you know, the early access to strategic, uh, you know, um, uh, parties, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there's obviously going to be more tickets than there are, uh, NFTs available. Right. Um, and so, you know, that there's going to be some mechanism. I, it hasn't yet been proposed by governance. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity for someone to come in and write uh, a proposal if you have a great idea, uh, for how to do this. Um, but the idea was to create a dynamic where there were enough tickets that there would be some mechanism by which they would be decided. It could be random. It could be, you know, uh, potentially ha having to perform some actions even, you know, um, but right now it's, it's still an open question of exactly how that will, mechanism will be, uh, will be designed. Okay. I, I hear you. Now the pricing is where like, this is. Um, this has kind of never been, never been done before because, you know, people are used to like lower token prices. Did you have any information on how your pricing is going to look and how it's maybe been worked out? Um, I think the mechanism that they went through was to look at some comparables, right. Um, you know, to, to look at different projects in the space that are doing different things, um, try and pick a price. And really, I think this was the the tension, right? Try and pick a price for these patron NFTs that would represent, you know, uh, a reasonable price to be able to get people in, you know, and but not so cheap that uh, it creates, you know, too much demand, right? So the the challenge that you have, and you know, I'm I'm playing this game all the time, right? A seed round at a 15 mil FDV, and and you know, there's a million dollars going into that seed round. Uh, there's excess demand just inevitably, right? Um, and so it becomes, you know, this jockeying for position, how much of an allocation are you going to get? All of that sort of stuff, right? Um, you know, now in theory, there's a trade there because, you know, there's risk of will the team execute, et cetera, et cetera, in a, in a seed round deal. Um, but we wanted, uh, you know, I think to, to create an environment here where uh, there was a, as much access as possible without the price being too high, right? Because the challenge is on the other side, if you wait until, you know, this low float token launches and is listed on Binance or something like that, right? Um, you know, the FTV is 5 billion, 8 billion, 10, 20, 50, you know, some, some multiple of billions of dollars, right? Um, well, now there's plenty of room for everyone uh, because, you know, everyone's paying too much, right? Um, and so, you know, there, there's uh, a challenge there in terms of uh, trying to thread that needle. Uh, and I don't think anyone really knows what that price is. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the people who wrote that proposal uh, looked at a bunch of different projects and, and tried to figure out the, you know, the best guess, right, of, of where this would land. Okay. And from the data I had, this was going to mint August, September. Was that just speculation or maybe poor research like no uh, i think that's i think i think it's speculation i think the the mint uh is probably 
September at this point. I mean, we're almost in August, right? So my guess is September, but I'm guessing too. Um, you know, there's still quite a bit of work uh, that needs to go into this. Um, so yeah, my, my best guess would be September probably. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll cover this specifically um, later on. Uh, there's a few more things, as I mentioned, um, for those people that got GP early on. And I asked, but I didn't quite get an answer here. But if there's a, a brand new person that comes into the community because uh, the GP was allocated during the speed run, is there any way for them to get GP these days? No, GP is done. That, that's done. over. Uh, there will be ways, I think, to win or earn uh, patron NFTs in the future, for sure, um, by doing some actions. But at the moment, there's no mechanism other than Crate Run. That's the only way you can win a patron. Awesome. Well, this is a good time to get your, well, for Solana people, Jupe, W, Radium, and W, Radium, Jito, Jito, Jito tokens. Well. Yeah. Get them in, get that boost. And there's plenty of other ones for those that are on the ETH network. I wanted to, uh, is, was there anything else you wanted to mention on Infinex before I just have some general kind of crypto questions for you? No, no, that's, uh, that's it. I think we covered everything. Okay. Uh, awesome. I really do appreciate it. It's been, it's, I'm, I'm excited. There'll be a lot of things to cover. I'm going to be, I'm already busy with content. I'm going to be even busier. Um, let me just quickly find these ones here. Yeah, where are they? Sorry. We'll, we'll do this rapid go. fire because I got to I got to uh, jump off in a couple of minutes. So gotcha. Um, so we'll, we'll all try right. And, let's see if we can. I'll try. That'll be really fast. I promise. Short. Okay. Um. <laughs> look, it was just like, do you have any suggestions for anybody? Uh, getting into crypto now like a bit of advice as someone that's been here they've seen everything like your best oh. tip <clears throat> um let's see um build conviction that's that's my advice right like find a thing you're convicted on uh find a thing you think that maybe the market's wrong about uh and build some conviction conviction is the only thing that will keep you sane in crypto awesome and the fight and the other question is do you have any predictions for this entire cycle? Obviously, last cycle, DeFi and NFTs. This cycle, maybe meme coins. Maybe you've got more of an edge here. Could be predictions uh, in anything. It, um, you know, my view is that like uh, cycles are cycles, right? You know, they every single time people are like, oh, this cycle is going to be different, right? This one's a super cycle. This one's going to be over quickly or whatever. Like. You know, they 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 tend to be quite similar uh, in in the overall dynamic, right? So, um, you know, really, it's like early adopters, enthusiasts who are still in crypto, grinding away in a bear market, building stuff, um, you know, inventing cool things, and then the world eventually wakes up and goes, "Oh wow, this is some cool stuff going on over here," and they get super excited about it, and you know, then. It turns into a crazy mania for you know six months or, or whatever, and then the majority of people leave. They get bored. They move on to something else. Uh, but a few of them stick around, and a few of those people start building new things. Right? Like that's that's how cycles evolve. That's how we keep investing more in in you know infrastructure, crypto, and getting better. Um, my hope is that this cycle we can do a better job of uh, of protecting new users. I don't think we did a very good job last last cycle. You know, sending everyone to FTX was a mistake, clearly. Um, yeah. So I, I'm hoping we can keep people on chain uh, this cycle. And you know, there's a lot of people working on this, not just Infinex. Um, you know, I, I would hope by the end of this cycle that we have multiple different on chain solutions for new users, not just uh, not just centralized exchanges. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kane. Best of luck, Thanks, and I'll sir. keep everyone uh, posted. Amazing. Appreciate your time. Thank you.